I would like to greet uh, every participant in this prestigious conference. Let me introduce myself. I am uh, Peter Chunterlik, research fellow at the Institute of Political History and uh, assistant professor at the Otto Schlorand uh, University. Uh, I will be the chair of this uh, section about uh, post and transnational history. There is a contradiction uh, in this uh, subdiscipline uh, called transnational history. Because history and uh, the historiography uh, was the product of the nationalism and uh, the modern historiography was the tool of uh, national building. So, in my opinion, the fundamental question is how can uh, the historiography be transnational? And uh, we, as historians, how can we deliberate ourselves uh, from the national perspectives? Because every one of us uh, was educated in a national way in the public education. <laughs> I don't have uh, answers of these questions because uh, I am not an expert uh, of uh, the post uh, and transnational uh, historiography, but uh, we have uh, special guests and uh, special uh, lecturers uh, who will uh, falsify my, my hypothesis about uh, this topic. Uh, let me introduce, first of all, um, Monica Barr. who is a joint chair in the history of East Central and Southeastern uh, Europe from the late 19th century to the present at European uh, University Institute in Florence in the Department of History. And uh, our second uh, lecturer uh, will be Imre Tarafash, assistant professor at the Otto Schlorand University. And the third one will be uh, Raul Kostocia, Assistant Professor in the 20th Century European History in the Maynard University from Ireland. Thanks a lot. So I would like to ask uh, Monica Barr for uh, uh, giving uh, her uh, introductory uh, speeches. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to mention that um, I, during uh, the course of the day I changed uh, my talk because initially I prepared to answer uh, uh, the questions that uh, we were given by Gabor but then first of all I saw that everyone had PowerPoints so I yielded to peer pressure but only just because I have two slides uh, and everyone is talking about their project uh, so I thought, why not? Uh, I'm going to use um, a project um, as a point of departure, but I'm going to align it actually with purposes of uh, this conference, although there might be a collateral damage that uh, I maybe no longer fall into the category of post and transnational history. Uh, and I don't know what category then uh, I would uh, fall into, uh, but perhaps um, what I say might be relevant to ponder the question during the discussion, how about comparison? Uh, did this method die out or can we bring it back or might it still be useful for us? So uh, in changing my topic, I was motivated by the panel, actually by all panels, economic history, uh, women's history, and then the global history. Uh, because I thought that uh, perhaps through um, women's history and gender history, uh, I can make um, a claim for uh, my field, which is the history of disability, um, because there are many similarities and overlaps. And so uh, one of the difficulties about this uh, project, and then I will try to relate it to uh, East Central Europe, which is another hurdle, that it is a new field. And um, uh, I would uh, quote actually Max Weber, who at the beginning of the 20th century said about sociology as a field that this is still in, uh, sociology is still in an adolescent age. It is still trying to invent this epistemological framework. 
uh, and this is uh, very similar for uh, the history of disability today. And if um, uh, the people who uh, talked about uh, women's history and global history mentioned that the Anglophone uh, uh, frameworks dominate for their field, then for disability history, this is really pathological. Uh, because uh, uh, scholars in the US and in Britain uh, wrote the first history of, uh, of disability and what they did were basically they universalizing the experiences uh, in their countries and that became the history of disability. So my question is, uh, if we are interested in the history of disability in East Central Europe, what can we do with this? Because there is no language uh, to describe phenomena, uh, we have to accept that there is, I mean, there's not yet a canon, but there is a certain uh, kind of, um, uh, consensus about what is disability history, and then it is really the problem of the regional historian to try to make uh, sense of it. So I will only have two slides, and um, the first one is just really uh, to illustrate that we might think of disability as a universal phenomenon because you know it, it seems to be so natural but in fact it is contingent across time and space and these are a couple of um, stamps uh, which we collected uh, for my project which was on the International Year of Disabled Persons which was organized by the UN in 1981 and I'm not sure this is visible but what I wanted to demonstrate there that it, even within the same linguistic group there were different designations for disability. Uh, so in the GDR uh, and in West Germany, disability was called differently. Behinderte, uh, Geschädigte, uh, in the Spanish speaking uh, were three different words were used. So uh, I would like to show that this is indeed uh, very much a, a phenomenon that is contingent on time and space. And the next one, just uh, the only uh, image that matters here is one in the candle. And I think that uh, the story uh, of this poster also stands for my story of how to try to um, regionalize uh, disability history and, and what kind of obstacles are there. So this is a poster from 1981. And uh, uh, so for this international year, um, UNESCO organized the poster competition. Uh, somehow to capture the message of the year. And this is the winning poster. Um, you see um, two candles, one is bent and one is actually straight and they are united in one flame. Uh, and I think we can make some kind of um, sense of it, you know, how it represents, I don't know, integration or whatever we want. Um, we were lucky to interview the uh, person who made the artist who made this poster. Uh, his name is Jacek Zwickla, he is Polish, and he designed uh, posters also for the Solidarity Movement. And because of this, and because of 1981, disability was very prominent uh, in, uh, uh, in Poland uh, at this time. So, uh, and as we were interrogating him about this universal message of the candle, he said, oh yeah, the candle. You know, I used the candle because Back then, 1980, 81, you know, we had state of exception. We always had power cuts. So we were obsessed with candles. Uh, and by the way, I worked in a candle factory for some time in West Germany. So uh, what I would like to illustrate is here is that we have this, you know, universal candle, but then there's the Polish story to this. And I think that this is what uh, I would be trying to do uh, when writing the history of disability in, uh, in Eastern Europe. So I started with um, complaining about these normative uh, and dominant Anglophone frameworks. And the story is this, I mean, there are a few um, um, images uh, also um, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the slide, which are not integral part of it, but I think uh, no one will be surprised that, you know, when we talk about the so-called disability movement, if it is mentioned at all, usually the first image that uh, occurs in our mind is someone in a wheelchair, although wheelchair using people constitute a very small percentage of disabled people and they are out in the street and they are protesting and they are chaining themselves to buses and stopping the traffic and this is called disability activism. Other um, things that are called disability activism in the literature which is uh, uh, produced by the Anglophone scholars is that well yes you know um, the, med the medical prof members of the medical profession, um, they, they don't understand us, they want to fix us, they think that the problem is with us, but the real problem is with society. 
and we are the real experts. So uh, we, we base our expertise on the lived experience. So uh, this movement is uh, against the, the uh, medical profession. Uh, and it's it's really visible and noisy and, and we see the wheelchair. So if we are applying this framework uh, to the same period, let's say state socialism, 70s, 1970s, 1980s, then I could as well conclude that there was no such thing as disability activism in, in Eastern Europe because people didn't go out to the street to protest. Uh, and very often, you know, when they were lobbying, in fact, they were collaborating uh, with doctors and with the medical uh, profession. So they were not the enemy. So it doesn't fit this uh, framework. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if we scratch the surface, of course, we will see that uh, there was indeed um, a degree of visibility in this region, but we have to find different frameworks and different ways to, to describe it. And I find it uh, interesting because I think uh, uh, Gabor asked us, you know, how did the field change and what, what was it like this before, two, three decades ago, and what, what is it like now? And I think that perhaps one dilemma um, has remained because when our region is being studied, uh, it's usually either in the framework of area studies, so we go to conferences and conventions where the focus is on this region, or there are some general narratives, and there the region almost inevitably it becomes somehow dissolves into this big mainstream nothing uh, uh, then the the backwardness uh, paradigm uh, uh, is hitting in and so the question is um, would it be possible in fact to use uh, the regional experiences uh, to nuance and modify certain pre-existing concepts and in my case this would be disability activism and uh, this is a question about which um, a small group of uh, scholars have already been thinking about. And I can mention a few cases and again to show that, um, that we, can, we can do such a thing, but then we have, uh, you know, we have to uh, modify this kind of uh, framework that, that we are left with. So first of all, um, the general public would think that uh, disabled people are by nature passive because of their impairments and very often this is the case so uh, again uh, i have to uh, admit that i will be talking about some exceptional cases here uh, still i think their agency uh, to use this um, overused word is uh, often underestimated and then when we are talking about disabled people in authoritarian states then people would immediately think that you know what, what could have these people uh, do if you know they were impaired in various ways because of the ideology and because of their condition however and here i would like to make a, a connection or comparison with the women's movement uh, they did have very um, useful types of agency that is the power of the powerless now what do i mean by this i mean if a group of pregnant women uh, go out to the street to protest even in the darkest authoritarian states, it is very unlikely that the police will shoot at them. And something similar can happen and did happen, not only in Eastern Europe, and I will uh, also go back to uh, comparative um, uh, methods later on. So uh, if a group of wheelchair users or people who look like crippled, um, uh, uh, they go out to the street to protest, then again, this creates a very, strange discomforting feeling for the authorities and and this is something that that they can uh, really use so first of all um, but then you know they might not go to the street but they might have more subtle ways to uh, to exercise this agency and i would mention two examples you know one that i studied myself and uh, the other one is actually uh, the result of an excellent phd uh, on the history of the deaf community in hungary so um, uh, again i did uh, oral history interviews uh, several years ago with a group of blind people here in hungary uh, who initiated uh, the hungarian guide dog school in the 1970s and this was against the um, governments and the uh, official authorities' wishes. They, they didn't want to accept this idea. What did they do? Uh, they approached high-profile politicians. It didn't really matter who these politicians were. Uh, and they also managed to co-opt the, the general public 
Um, some of us uh, know about this so-called Communist Saturday, so um, a lot of voluntary work was invested in uh, building the Hungarian Guide Dog School, which again was a really a grassroots initiative. Uh, the other example is not even about agency or not only about that, but it might also be quite unexpected, and that is uh, the intersection between disability and religion. Now, uh, disabled people exercising their religion, especially in sign language, that might also not be the most kind of uh, evident um, um, uh, case study we might think of. And yet, it turns out that uh, in 1972, uh, the first uh, Catholic mass in sign language was held here in Budapest. And this is also interesting because this was at a time when sign language was still suppressed or at least not encouraged and when the Vatican still had no theological discussions on whether to allow sign language or not. And of course I wouldn't like to make the claim that in Hungary even before the Vatican whatever resolutions there was already a mess in sign language because when we look at the actual case it was a very pragmatic thing. Uh, there were two nuns of course uh, not uh, not openly uh, exercising uh, their religion but uh, in, in, in the communist period you know using uh, um, civilian clothes and so on and their parents were deaf and in this way uh, they knew sign language and there was a small community and uh, so it was a matter of demand and supply um, and even though this was a very small group uh, i think we, we shouldn't forget about them because i see all the um, also the the oral history interview um, um, accounts uh, when they um, when they tell about this first mass uh, they say well and we realized that this was a historical moment and everyone had tears in their eyes. So um, again, they also mentioned that they can do this, they could only do this like semi-clandestinely because if blind, if deaf people go out to the street and they start signing, they are immediately noticed. So, um, so again, what I would like to show with this that, you know, th there was, you know, there was a way to navigate uh, 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 under also under authoritarian uh, circumstances and um, in every country we can uh, we can find I mean I just now mentioned the Hungarian examples because we are in Hungary but you know we have the the Polish ones uh, just you know one uh, uh, one um, uh, issue about Poland uh, because uh, as I mentioned the American uh, and British um, scholarship is very hostile to the idea of rehabilitation because they think that it's, uh, uh, you know, it's about fixing the individual and in fact society should be fixed. But in fact, rehabilitation could be very useful uh, in improving uh, uh, people's um, uh, actual um, uh, work, uh, living conditions. And when we look at uh, the countries in post-war Europe, which had a very good, uh, very advanced rehabilitation uh, system and those which didn't, uh, it again turns out that there was not much ideological in it, uh, in Cold War terms. Uh, it was much more pragmatic because those countries that had lost a lot of people during the war and were in need of workforce, even if not fully functional, they did invest in rehabilitation. And those countries uh, that didn't have their problem, they, they were okay with like, keeping their disabled people unemployed and uh, living on the poverty margin. So um, going back to method, and again, uh, I don't know in, uh, in what uh, category uh, this uh, story would fall uh, methodologically, but uh, I would like to refer back to something ref uh, mentioned by Balint um, and something that I thought of and we were asked to reflect on the state of the field 20, 30 years ago, which unfortunately I can do because uh, <laughs> I've been here uh, a part of the furniture longer than some of the junior uh, scholars. So uh, what I recalled immediately was uh, the super fashionable nature of transitology. Uh, and I was asking myself, what is left out of it? And so this was for the younger generation, maybe. So there was a boom in the 1990s uh, among political scientists, you know, about making comparisons between the democratic transitions in Eastern Europe and Latin America, not really interested in the historical uh, uh, context and circumstances. And again, uh, 
I don't think there's much left that, that we can use. But still, the comparison with Latin America, um, it uh, occurred as I was, uh, I started to have conversations with colleagues working on uh, the Latin American dictatorships. Um, and it seems that uh, indeed, this might be a very useful uh, avenue to pursue. And once again, I think we are left with the problem, you know, what is universal about disability uh, and what is contingent on the ideolo ideological regimes. And I wouldn't like to complicate the issue even further because of course it's a very um, heterogeneous uh, um, uh, concept and if I have I have one or two more minutes. Uh, um, we were mentioning also the necessity of doing uh, intersectional research. And I think here uh, there's also um, a lot of potential because people are not disabled only. I mean, they have other identities and it's very diff different to be uh, disabled as a woman uh, or as a man. Uh, it's, it's also, it has its own um, challenges, for instance, uh, to be um, a disabled uh, homosexual person. Why? Because then you you might fall, um, you might be excluded by both identity groups. Because uh, disabled um, uh, groups, they are often very uh, very conservative. Whereas maybe the LGBTQI subculture, where the body uh, aesthetics is very important, you as a disabled person do not fit in. So I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, of course, uh, the life course might be useful, children, uh, elderly people, and so on and so forth. And last but not least, I think there's, uh, I know that some people in the audience have been already uh, studying this. Uh, there are certain experiences of disabled people um, abuse, uh, institutional, uh, in institutional setting, uh, scandals that seem to have occur occurred um, throughout Europe and throughout the world. So that might also be uh, useful to study in the future in a more comprehensive and perhaps a comparative way. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Imre, please uh, give your introductory lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, well, Gabor Agri, for inviting me to this exciting conference. I did take this 10 minute time limit uh, that seriously, so I will be quite brief. Uh, my connection to transnational history is that my PhD was a comparative research on Austro German, Hungarian, and Czech historiography between. 1867 and 1914. This meant, on the one hand, uh, of course, the analysis of these three historiographies, but on the other hand, a more general uh, level of historical argumentations presented in uh, mostly political pamphlets. So I consider that my interest in my primary interest is in uh, intellectual history and history of ideas which I happened to approach from historiography. And it had been my aim and it remained my aim to treat the empire as an empire, so as a whole. Uh, I also took the questions in the invitation a bit seriously. I, I did not, not give in to the pressure. Uh, and in the invitation, we were asked to talk about significant trends in our specific field of study. This is rather an easy task when it comes to the Habsburg Empire. This trend is present in the historiography of the empire since decades and brought about true paradigm change in the field as it rethinks basic assumptions about the empire. Perhaps the best way to describe this now thankfully large body of literature is that they decisively break with the traditional nationalist tropes and either concentrate on the empire as a whole or on regional and local developments. Several of these scholars showed that nationalism and national consciousness were not as omnipresent and pivotal as thought before. The view that the world was made up by nations and everyone was for forcefully part of one of these nations was not shared by all inhabitants of the empire. National activists made great efforts to spread this worldview and even if they partially succeeded, and people were, for example, voting for nationalist politicians on elections, the very same people usually maintained certain practices in their everyday lives, which contradicted the worldview of nationalists. 
This is what some scholars call situational national indifference, which is a term that has been disputed uh, ever since. The other major thesis, which I think is even more emphasized in Peter Judson's major 2016 book, which provides a remarkable synthesis on the of the findings of this approach, I'm talking, of course, about the Habsburg Empire, a new history, is that the empire was far from being an unworkable anachronism. Not only was it modernizing, but its inhabitants were well aware that the imperial state is, was functioning and it was doing so for their benefit. This view seems to be making its way into the larger public as well. Uh, the New York Times, for example, published an article in 2019 entitled What the Habsburg Empire Got Right. I think that the post, post and transnational way of looking at history is quintessential in the case of the Habsburg Empire. Not only because of the most evident reason that it was a supranational and later a multinational empire, but also for more general methodological reasons. In futures past, Reinhard Kozelek pointed out that there is a serious danger in learning about historical processes based on the same counter concepts as those that contemporaries experienced and used for interpreting their world. My favorite example for this is Tocqueville's L'Ancien Régime et la Révolution. The French revolutionaries thought of and represented themselves as destroyers of the ancient regime, whereas the historical research of Tocqueville shows that from a very important aspect, the French Revolution continued and perfected a major feature of absolutism, which was centralization. The national view of history, uh, as Peter mentioned, of history and the world in general was a 19th century perception, which thus should be critically re-evaluated in historical research. In fact, it seems to me that what the new approach does can be described as the critical rethinking of certain contemporary nationalist interpretations of the world. The omnipresence of the national idea has already been mentioned. Equally important is the often opposed notions of nation and empire, about which new research showed that they were far from being binary opposites. In fact, the imperial administration was instrumental for nationalists to create mass national communities after 1848, and especially around 1880. In turn, empire gained legitimacy from some nationalists who saw it as a guarantee for their existence in the region, which would be dominated by Germany and Austria, if uh, Germany and Russia, if Austria perished. It is undoubtable that these researchers are theoretically well-informed students of history. However, they rarely, rarely provide their readers with explicit theoretical reflections. Nevertheless, there is a, a remarkable historian of Habsburg Central Europe whose theoretical considerations could underpin the above mentioned inspiring empirical researches, as well as post and transnational history in general. This scholar is Moritz Chaki, who is, at least it is my impression, a bit overlooked when it comes to listing historians who have to break with nationalist tropes. In these days, I find myself, these years, I find myself uh, talking and writing about Chucky quite a lot. In fact, uh, Christian Chaplar Dagovic wrote about me that my main aim is to introduce the Chucky school in Hungarian historiography, and I'm very happy with this categorization. <clears throat> I would be glad to wear it on a t-shirt. Uh, what Chaki offers us is the application of the theoretical framework of cultural studies on the region which he calls Central Europa. Unlike 19th century nationalists who thought of culture in essentialist terms, Chaki offers a practice-oriented approach to culture. He sees culture as a set of signs that enables people to make themselves understood. He builds on Yuri Lotman's theory of the semiosphere which refers to an abstract yet real space, the essence of which is heterogeneity. Different signs compete within this space and dynamically interact with each other. A flagrant example of the hybrid cultural configurations of Central Europa is a musical world of Vienna about which Chaki wrote his best work. The central notion of this culture definition is the frontier. For Chaki, the frontier is a zone where the signs cluster. 
frontier, frontiers, of course, divide because different signs, symbols, codes, or even peoples and social groups meet, confront each other, and define themselves in their opposition to the other. For nationalists, this was the only function of the frontier, as Judson showed us in his excellent book, which was titled Guardians of the Nation. Nevertheless, frontiers also unite as they make communication and interaction possible. They function as a zone of contact where crossings and translations can be realized. To further develop this concept, Chucky introduces the notion of the third space, which he adopts from post-colonial studies. In this third space, cultural codes and traditions meet and mutually influence each other and intertwine. This space is not only an abstract notion, but can represent real spaces as well, which create hybrid identities, a good example of which is the composer Gustav Mahler. In the remaining minute, uh, I would like to point to a few directions which I would consider fruitful. Not surprisingly, I would argue for researches of the processes that happen in this above-mentioned third space. The interactions, crossings, mutual influences of the different cultural spaces of the monarchy can help us treat it as an empire and not simply as a conglomerate of nations. My other suggestion is still related to comparative history, but at this time the comparison is between the empire and other European countries. Judson has already encouraged historians to look at those countries and empires which, usually, which are usually not considered comparable with the Habsburg monarchy. I would add Belgium to this list, even though I am well aware that it seems absurd. In the 19th century, one is a young Western European small country, while the other is an old Central European empire. However, there is at least one similarity between the two. Ideologically, they were facing very similar challenges, as they were both declared by their rivals to be artificial contracts, uh, constructs without a proper past and an organic state. And with this last thought, we, uh, uh, by the way, we have come full circle because it, it, uh, it was this situation that is Belgium not having a so-called proper national history, which, was par which partially inspired Henri Piren to elaborate the concept of comparative history. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And now uh, I'd like to ask you, Raul, to provide an overview about uh, uh, the history of the post and uh, transnational historiography. And uh, please tell me a bit about uh, the most important authors and the most important works and approaches in this field. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I did not yield to peer, peer pressure. Um, I, I also because I'm extremely honored and grateful to, to Gabor for the invitation. And I, what I prepared was not a lecture for sure, but bullet points on the questions that, that Gabor sent us, which I think are very important questions. And I, th I, you know, I am, I'm, I'm very aware that by providing sort of like a broad overview, I'm very likely to, to trespass on, on various territories here, new imperial history, global history, things we've heard before and today and that we're going to hear more about tomorrow. Um, but to paraphrase what Laura was saying earlier, if I'm successful, I will make every, any, everybody in the room I'm happy. And um, if, if not, then I'll at least provide some comic relief to the people who are actually specialists in these respective areas. Um, one thing I think what was missing from a lot of the presentations today, except for the morning panel, was the political context. And I think the political context is very important to keep in mind if we think of post-national and transnational histories. Now, I don't have Monica's privilege of having been in academia at the time when, when you know, socialism collapsed, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I was still old enough to be coming of age at the time. So uh, the 90s, the, this is period of the 90s was when I went to college and uh, therefore I was exposed in my college years to this, you know, the, the collapse of socialism, the, the EU enlargement, the post-national narratives that were proliferating, everybody saying the time of the nation is over, the European Union is marching on, Eastern Europe is rejoining Europe. Nobody took Fukuyama and the end of history seriously, but everybody was quite optimistic about the future of the region. 
I was so unconvinced by this that I followed up my BA by doing an MA at CU on nationalism studies because I thought, no, the nationalism, nationalist paradigm is not in any shape or form um, overcome or, or, you know, we, we haven't moved beyond it. When I was asked to, to, to point at the, at the most relevant development in the last two or three decades, I did put my finger on national indifference, and we heard about that from, from Imre. I think that, in, in so far at least as the region is concerned, to me, in terms of, of post-national history, national indifference has been the, the main paradigm. Um, it does fit more with the post-national in the title of our panel than the transnational, but of course it does have transnational implications. It did emerge in conjunction with the new imperial history, about which I think we will hear more yesterday, uh, tomorrow, but it, which itself I think was partly prompted by the same political conjuncture. It wasn't just in 2019 that the New York Times was pointing at the Habsburg Empire as a as, as a model for the European Union, that's something we heard in the 90s, but we're starting to hear in the 90s already, this, this sort of like multinational happy empire uh, as, a, as a prototype of the European Union. And to me, I think an important thing that came out of national indifference was an, an implicit discovery or rediscovery of history from below in the context of Central and Eastern Europe, which had I think has ramifications into much more than issues of national indifference or not. You might disagree with the paradigm, but I think the focus on history from below has remained an attention to non-state actors, their agency and their involvement in more macro regional, continental or even global processes is, I think at least, as something that possibly grew out of this post-national uh, orientation. What is interesting to me at the same time is that this is post-national fine, but chronologically, what this meant was a step back to the pre-national period, right? To the period of empires. The national indifference paradigm grew out of, a, of an interest in late 19th century, early 20th century, Central and Eastern Europe, a time before the establishment of the nation states as the dominant paradigm in international relations. So that's just, just flagging potential interesting things. There are of course issues with national indifference. And just recently in July, 2023, there was a themed section on in, in, nation, in nations and nationalism edited by Martin van Kinderachter, who incidentally is a good colleague and friend and who is a firm believer in the validity of national indifference, but someone who is also extremely frustrated by the fact that it keeps being limited to Central and Eastern Europe. He, on several occasions, tried to expand it beyond the area and failed. Like he confessed to me once, he had this major grant from, from Antwerp in Belgium to to study national indifference. And the first conference he organized in, in <laughs> I hope he's not listening, he, he was saying, you know, I wanted to have a European event and it ended up being a conference on the Czech lands, on Bohemia. There was hardly any paper outside Bohemia. And if it was, it was still somewhere in the area here. Um, and in this uh, theme section, he's, he's commenting about this. The theme section includes a, a case study of the Netherlands and one of Finland, but, if we look at the productions on national indifference, I think I still think the area of Central and Eastern Europe keeps being, you know, overrepresented to say the least. Um, and he, he's, un, he's, he's wondering in this theme section, again, as, as a convert, as someone who believes in national um, indifference and who has written a book on national indifference in the Flemish context, um, the Flemish 19th century context, he still wonders if this is not reproducing orientalizations of the region as, as, as somehow being backward as, as you know of course we, we know the national indifference paradigm was challenging the notion of, of pre-national as being somehow backward he's also raising two other important questions i think uh, whether this is itself a, if it reproduces another binary so not just east and west nationalism but a binary to national identification so we have national indifference on the one hand and national identification on the other and whether this binary itself can also um, be somehow associated with different social groups. So you have elites who are nationalists and the masses who are nationally indifferent. And this is, we know, a problematic binary and one that the national indifference paradigm might reproduce. Um, I think I'm done with the post-national. I can move on to the transnational. There, were, there, has, there have been, I think, some very important um, uh, developments here in the last two or three decades. I would point to two examples, the four volume series at Brill, Entangled Histories of the Balkans, published between 2013 and 2017, as a good way of, of I think, approaching a region, a sub-region, as we heard this morning, uh, transnationally. The other one has already been mentioned earlier, and Monica Bar is, is one of the, of the co-authors, the, the history of modern political thought in East Central Europe, which was at the time a, a groundbreaking development, I think. And of course, the present project, Nepostrans, which with its focus on the local region, is another excellent example of a transnational approach to Central and Eastern Europe. And on that note, just a side note, the historic Rasse approach in this particular project is, I find it as the most welcome addition because studies 
in my view, transnational studies in Central and Eastern Europe have tended to be entangled or comparative histories with the national or alternatively empire, often as a reference point, even in the attempts to go beyond it. I think the combination of looking at local dynamics, regional dynamics in the present project is, is a very useful development along these lines. But to go back to the concepts in history of modern political thought, which again was, was, was for me a, a, a fundamental influence in my own trajectory, the concepts there I found to be predefined, which I have a problem with and which we, we heard earlier in Monica's presentation. Often these concepts come to us from different scholarships. And I, I, that, that was my particular issue with that particular book. Uh, and I think what we need to do in terms of steps forward is to, to look for I think what we, what we need is more grounded assessment on the corpora, because if we look closely at the corpora in our respective settings, we might find unexpected important concepts. And I'll give you one example, and here I'm, I'm, I'm also finally connecting to some of the things I actually do. Um, one of the things that me and a colleague of mine found was the importance of colonial and colonialism in late 19th century and early 20th century Romania. Independently, we discovered this, me working on the interwar, him working on the 19th century, we came across like, this is everywhere. And why the hell is it everywhere since Romania was not a, any kind of formal way a colonial space? Why is this important to um, elite state builders in, in 19th century and, and early 20th century Romania? And more importantly, why does it mean so many different things and why these different things are very different from uh, the way in which colonialism is conceptualized in a West, Western European context. And out of this GRUA project, which I'm currently involved in, led by Silvia Marton as, as, as primary investigator, entitled Colonial Anxieties, Corruption Scandals and Xenophobia in 19th Century Infrastructure Development in Romania. Now that's a mouthful for a title and it's a, it's a probably a crazy association, but it's something that's driven by the corpora. It's something, driven by, it's something that's driven by what we found in the primary sources, i.e. a very surprising association of colonialism with notions of corruption. Corruption is not native, it's not, you know, it can't be native because then we're a bad country and of course we're a great country, so we can't be corrupt. Corruption is always, always comes from outside. It can come from the past and here the, the Fanariot past serves as the, as the pseudo-colonial uh, past uh, reference point, or it can come in the present from foreigners, the Jews and the Germans being the two main groups seen in, in 19th century and early 20th century Romania as responsible for introducing corruption to the country. And because we had to narrow it down, because first there was just so many sources related to these two concepts and their association, we chose infrastructure development because this is also a time of the, of the building of Romania's major infrastructure, both railways, the Romanian railway system is completed by 1890. Um, the, most of it is, is there. Uh, if you talk about the, the old kingdom of Romania, of course, not Transylvania, which is not part of our project. Um, but then the same applies to, 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 to the, the port and the, 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 the waterways, let's say. And in, there are multiple scandals where you can see this intersection of, of, um, of uh, corruption and colonialism. And these different semantics of concepts in Central and Eastern European context are also the, 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 something that Silvia will investigate right now. Um, her ERC advanced grant is starting in October. And she will be looking into the semantics of corruption in Southeastern Europe between 1750 and 1850. Again, because it's a, it's a fundamental trope that we, we know how important it is in the present day, but one that hasn't been investigated in its proper context. And one of the things that I want to emphasize it, yes, I am, I'm a firm believer in analyzing things in the proper context. Another welcome development, maybe I'll just go quickly through this because we've, I mean, I, I, I really don't want to take more than 15 minutes of your time, is a focus on environmental history. This has been mentioned before and I, I find it the most salutary development. Again, moving a bit beyond the nation and beyond human agency, if you want. Uh, Patrice Dabrowski's recent the Carpathians, I, I found to be a, a very inspiring development along these lines. There's a project or research network based at the IOS Regensburg uh, Contested Waterway Governance and Ecology of the Lower Danube, 1800 to 2018, which I think is, again, a, a great development, both in terms of the long durée approach, which we, we, we saw the, the usefulness of that earlier this morning, but also in terms of, of treating the Danube itself as an historical actor, the, the river, not just looking at the, at the agents around the Danube. Um, I also found in some interesting developments in going beyond the region, because one of the things that we tend to do is bring the world into Eastern Europe, but I think there's more to be said about bringing Eastern Europe to the world. Um, and in this respect, an edited volume uh, on the on Matica, 
um, was, was, an int was quite interesting to me because this is an East European type of institution that has a very European trajectory. And in the volume, the, the, the model of the Matica, which comes from the region, is traced in places like Spain, Netherlands, um, France, Wales, Ireland. Um, and this is, I, I think I find this an interesting way of connecting Central and Eastern Europe, sort of like mainstream European history. Uh, there's also recent work that, that connects the region to explore the more Mediterranean or at least Adriatic connections. Dominique Royal's work on the Adriatic and on the Fiume, um, uh, or Constantin Alzano's transnational patriotism in the Mediterranean, 1800 to 1850, stammering the nation, being prime examples of this. Um, also, in terms of transnational history, and well, another project I'm involved with is an, is an ERC starting grant based at the Institute for Mediterranean Studies in Greece which is entitled Screening Souls, Building Nations, Macedonia's in the plural as a laboratory for, for Balkan-wide authoritarianism led by Tassos Kostopoulos' SPI. And in this project, we are approaching the Macedonian question as a, as a transnational history of an eminently transnational question, which has been treated very differently in national historiographies. And we make the point that it has been misunderstood or misinterpreted precisely because we have these various takes on the Macedonian question. We don't have a Macedonian question composed of these various approaches to it. Um, for example, population movements across very highly contested borders is an essential element of the Macedonian question. But the interesting outcome of this is that it does end up feeding into and reinforcing national authoritarianism in the Inter-World Balkans. Um, even if it's an eminently transnational thing, even if it's, even if it's flowing and moving, the, the ultimate consequence of the Macedonian question is that it becomes a nationalist choke in each of these separate contexts. And I think the, the project is an interesting way of, of making the transnational feedback into the national. And with this, I come to my last point. My last point is, again, questioning the context, the present day context. Is the nation striking back against both national and transnational uh, interpretations? And Maria Todorova, for one, is someone who has never been convinced by national indifference. She called it a chaotic effort to dethrone the nation, nation state. And she doesn't believe, I know this from personal conversations as well, in its applicability to the Balkans despite my insistence otherwise. Um, Sinisha Malesevic has a very interesting concept of grounded nationalisms, um, of, of the ever, you know, the, the continuous growth of the infrastructural capacity of the state. We might feel like ideologically we've gone beyond the national paradigm, but in terms of infrastructure, the state has only gotten more powerful in reinforcing nationalism um, as, as a paradigm. And in his view, nationalism do not, do not rise and fall, they just kept on rising ever since nationalism appeared on the scene. And what we're, what we're witnessing now is, is kind of a climax. Uh, or John Connolly's 2020 from Peoples into Nations, about which I don't think I need to say <laughs> anymore. Um, one thing that I also found missing in the discussions today, and one thing that's very dear to me, is stepping a bit outside of our ivory tower and outside of academia. What is the relevance of all these new histories beyond the academic context? And here, I work at the Council of Europe's new observatory on history teaching in Europe, which looks at history education in pre-higher education settings. And we might find these developments in academic history wonderful, and we might think of the history of disability and environmental history and all these fantastic new things in Central Asia. Have they in any way, not displaced, but even touched the national paradigm in history education before, in, in, in you know, pre-higher education? And my answer would be absolutely not. Um, and when it comes to you know pre-university education, when it comes to anybody who's not doing history as a specialist program, they have chosen, but who are exposed to history, whether they like it or not, as, as you know secondary school or high school students, they will learn national and nationalist history. And when I was talking to colleagues, Rock Stergar, one of them, uh, saying, "Well, this is a problem in pre-higher education," he was like, "Really? You think it's only in pre-higher education?" Um, I think when it comes to Central and Eastern Europe, the, the focus on national and nationalist histories is also a problem in higher education, not just in pre-higher education. But I also think that we need to think of, if, if we are worried about manipulations of history, and I'll get to Ukraine with that, um, if we are worried about manipulation of history, if we're worried about this history being used for disinformation or for political purposes, we're not going to change much if we don't look beyond academia. I mean, if, we, if I convince 100 people in this room and maybe 500 other people who are all historians that, wow, the post-national paradigm is really great, it's not going to make a difference at societal level. If we manage somehow to influence textbook writing, if we somehow manage to influence curricula, if we manage to effect change there, we might have a chance of, of fighting back against it.
manipulation of history, disinformation, and stuff like this. Um, and, and along these lines, and, and linking to the to the project, can we incorporate insights from post-national and transnational histories into a new national history? Because the likelihood of the national curriculum being replaced by a transnational curriculum is effectively zero, in my view, at least in the near future. What we can instead is maybe incorporate some insights from these various histories we're doing into a new national history that would be different by factoring in disability, things like sexual minorities, things like the, the, the things that usually do not correspond to national political history. Um, and, can, and should we do this? Or should, would this even be counterproductive? If you make a new national history that's actually more inclusive and more diverse, maybe it becomes a beast we can't handle. Um, so you know, just questions I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with. Um, and speaking of that, is this, is this, you know, is this nation striking back a, a new political context? Uh, is it have, does it have to do with the right-wing populism, the recent increase in nationalism that everybody talked about um, across Central Eastern Europe and Europe more generally? But there's an interesting recent take about this, and, and here I have the privilege of having colleagues who share their work before it's published. So that's how I know about this. It's in press. It's going to come out, I think, either later this month or next month. Two articles by Olena Palko criticizing the new imperial history or imperial turn in relation to Ukraine and in relation to its acting as a potential legitimization of the current Russian imperial project. Saying, you know, what if this taming of empire, what if this seeing of empire, not along the lines of colonization and conquest, but along the lines of diversity, uh, a, a shift that Susan Smith Peters called from colonization and to colonization, but, so yes, colonization and conquest, yes, violence, but there are good things to come out of empire diversity and, and, you know, the management of everything. What if this helped legitimize the Russian imperial project? The Habsburg Empire didn't go to war with its neighbors, the Russian one, the, the, the successor to the Russian one did. And this, in when I read her draft, which was where it is too political, I, my comment was, you're talking about Russocentrism in East European studies, and that's absolutely clear if you look at the, the chairs in East European history in the US. Russian is everywhere. It's it's uh, it's 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 as ubiquitous as in the Cold War period. But what if this is a pot potential metropolis centrism in Central Eastern Europe more generally? I mean, you were mentioning Judson's book. It's a fantastic book. It's a superb account of the Habsburg Empire. It's heavily Austria. It's have Austria focused. The Hungarian half of the empire gets way less attention than the Austrian half of the empire. And this, in, in a lot of the, the new imperial history of the Habsburg Empire, the same happens. It's very focused on Vienna, which does make sense because archives are in Vienna more than, I mean, you're, you're going to have more access to archives. You know? So, and the same applied to Russia, right? I mean, the, the Moscow centralized a lot of the, the, the local archives and offered privileged access to people who were, were willing to collaborate with the regime in order to get access to said archives. So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated, political thing to, to, to consider. Since everybody talked about their projects, and I have one too, um, I should mention it and because I, I think it's also along the lines of, of this transnational history. My own ERC project on global fascism, which is under review at the moment, which is a very euphemistic way of saying I've got slightly more than two weeks, slightly less than three weeks left until the interview. Um, and what I'm trying to do is, is global fascism through a transnational approach to fascism, which is the prime example of an ultra-nationalist ideology, right? So writing a transnational history of fascism should be quite improbable. Um, and Bella is not here anymore, but it could be one of those things that you would object to as well. Maybe we don't need a global history of this. Um, and we don't have one at the moment. Um, it's grounded in a historic cross methodology, which moves across scales of analysis. And I very much like to see this in Gora's project because that's what I intend to do from the micro, from the level of local, like individual fascist activists to local levels, national levels, regional levels, to the global level. Um, and it has a focus on time and temporality as the key to bring together fascist regimes with fascist movements that did not come to power. Because if we only consider the fascist regimes and as a global turn in fascism studies in the last five years, the global turn has meant scholars have finally agreed. That, that, that means, that's not possible to translate. Okay. Okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry about the. I'm. Uh, the thing that pro my project proposes is that we can read the transnational and global not as flowing seamlessly, 
but by factoring in the resistance or the breakdown of connections. Um, not as a limit of globalization, not as, not as a limit of the transnational, but that's something that's inherent in the global. Um, and in this sense, the global in my project is definitely not the universal. The fascists were anything but universalists. They were anti-universalists. But I argue that this did not prevent them from having a vision of the global, which was very much grounded in their particularism, in their specificities, which are always national. And this leads to the tension between fascists having connections with each other, connections which span continents. Um, Romania and Brazil were the, was the discovering co connection between Romanian and Brazilian fascists was where I got the idea of the project. Um, but at the same time, each of them, of course, insisted on the national specificity, and this in turn means that every fascist movement was uh, different, even if they saw themselves as being part of a global moment or global movement. And that's insisting on your specificity and being part of a global movement are not necessarily incompatible. Thank you. I'm really, really sorry. Apologies to the, to the um, interpreters for my pacing. Thanks a lot. Um, first, uh, let me ask a bit uh, personal question. The history and uh, the historiography uh, partly is a science, partly is a literature, and uh, partly is a way of uh, self-identification. Why did you become attracted to this uh, transnational approach, which uh, positioned itself against the traditional nationalist historiography. See, well, I did manage to annoy everybody, including the interpreter. I'm just, I had, it had to be said. Um, very, very personal question, very useful one in my case. Um, I was born in Transylvania. One grandmother was Hungarian, one was Roma. Uh, my grandfather was Ukrainian, and the other grandfather was Romanian. So I'm a typical Transylvanian in this respect. Um, there were, at any point in time, three, four languages spoken in my household. Uh, the notion of being national was always up in the air. Um, I didn't speak all of those languages. I don't understand Hungarian. <laughs> my grandmother didn't want to teach me Hungarian. But to me, the, 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 the story at home was a story that was not national. I wouldn't say, I don't know if you can call it post-national, transnational, whatever you want to call it, but national it was not. Well, uh, to quote uh, Gergő, I might be the least interesting person to, to reply this, uh, to this question. When I... Uh, when people asked what my PhD topic was on, I told them this Austro-German-Czech-Hungarian comparison, and they always guessed that my grandmother was Czech and on the other side my grandfather was Austrian. But no, not, nothing like it. I, I, I just thought it was more interesting than uh, staying in the national framework. So, so it's, it's an intellectual adventure sometimes painful when it comes to learning Czech, but uh, otherwise it's a great uh, intellectual adventure, that's all. Okay, so I think it's um, a very interesting question why it is almost taken for granted that um, through the choice of our topic we are trying to deal with our identity or identity crisis. As you can imagine, I often get the question Oh, you are working on the history of disabled people. Do you, do you see somebody in your family, blah, blah, blah? And my answer is usually, I also work on the history of dogs, but people barely ever ask if I'm a dog or my, my family members. So I think it, it shows you know, how artificial this is. And I think that um, I think maybe all the three of us, uh, even if we are not supposed to admit uh, this openly, I think one reason might have been or motivation is that we were bored with this kind of um, vulgarized versions of national history because we, we might have a separate 
conversation on whether it is possible to write good national histories, but you know, most of uh, the versions we are confronted with, and especially at the institutional level, are such that, um, that they are very useful for instigating new fields of interest or new angles in our research. Thanks. Thanks a lot uh, for the honest answers. And uh, now uh, I have a, a, a pointed question to Monica. Uh, could you answer uh, me why uh, the Marxist historiography was not interested in the history of disabled person? <laughs> because uh, yeah, first, it, it is an international movement. It is an activist movement. And uh, third, in the Hungarian history, primarily in the revolution of 1918 and 1919, uh, the disabled war veterans were the most radical uh, supporters of the uh, party of the Hungarian communists. Why? Why this is this lack in the Hungarian Marxist historiography? This is a wonderful question because, of course, I didn't go into the details of this Anglophone historiography I was uh, mentioning, but the British um, uh, side of this historiography is so much Marxist that um, uh, they were called Marxist lunatics uh, by welfare state organizations. So, funny enough, there was very much an interest among Marxist scholars uh, in this topic, but it didn't come from our region, it came from a capitalist country. But it, it very much aligns with all these issues of course, uh, exclusion, and not to speak of the intersections between class and disability. So, the question is excellent. And uh, now, generally, um, I think a good example of the gravity uh, of the traditional uh, uh, nationalist historiography uh, for the story of the Eastern Marxist historiography. Although uh, the international labor movement is an ideal object of the transnational approach, the Eastern uh, uh, Marxist historiography uh, is not product of, of a truly uh, transnational uh, 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 historiography. For instance, even uh, Emil Niederhauser, um, who was uh, an excellent expert of the Eastern uh, European history, um, was not able to, to overlap the, the comparative history. And uh, Ivan Berend and Jörg Janki who were the, the most prestigious and most acknowledged uh, experts in, in comparative history. They were comparative historians and they, they compared uh, the, 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 the French data and the Hungarian data and the Romanian data, but, uh, but they, they didn't provide a, a, a transnational approach. Although Eric Hasbom in the Western Marxist historiography in, in 1962, uh, uh, published uh, uh, his, his uh, uh, monograph uh, with the title Age of Revolution, which was, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, a transnational uh, summary uh, before it uh, uh, became into fashion. By the Eastern uh, Marxist historiography uh, there was not, not able to, to provide a transnational approach. I don't know. No? <laughs> so, anyone in the audience who can answer me the question? No, that's <laughs> give, give the answer. Oh, uh, please provide the mic, Mike. Socialism in what one country? In the late twenties, he decided that for Western capitalist country, 
the only perspective was the nation state perspective. That was the only way. In 35, everyone remembers Popular Front and the Seventh Congress of the International. That's the, the main point. The main point is strict national path, the end. But for the Soviet Union, which was a different type of thing. But as you know, in the 30s, the different type of thing meant very strong Russian domination. Just go to Ukraine and you, you get the story, which was not the case in the middle of the 20s. So basically, you have a, a thing that you don't think about. Why is that Hungary or Poland or Czechoslovakia were maintained after 45? Why didn't they do as in 39, 41? It's, it's a basic conception and never one came, no one came over it. If you look at the history of what you call in English Comic-Con, uh, it's contacts were incredibly hard, unproductive. Even the Warsaw Pact, if you look at the practical story of 68 and the invasion, there was no collaboration. So it would have been totally impossible to think transnational. It would be, have been a crime. Look at what happened with the Federation projects of Dimitrov and the others. It was strictly impossible, absolutely. It's... Thanks a lot. No, I open the floor uh, to the question. It's not that important, but uh, regarding Emil Niederhauser, uh, who I admire greatly, and I have read many of his works, uh, but he, he, I, I don't think that he ever challenged uh, these kind of methodological questions and methodological uh, traditions. He, you know, he looked at uh, national movements, but he never questioned such notions as national movement. Or in his great historiographical work, he uses categories as developed historiography after 1918. What does that mean, developed history? So he, he, he didn't have, I think, this kind of inclination to look behind categories. He, uh, but he still uh, did pioneering work because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to read about uh, our neighbor nations in Hungarian, uh, about their historiography and their natural movement. So I think there is a banal reason as well that some people just, you know, they are not interested in these kind of questions. Thanks. Thank you so much. I, uh, I mean, I share a lot of skepticism, which, which Raoul was uh, expressing. Uh, and I will actually continue with, with it tomorrow. Uh, I will be talking about post-colonial then. Uh, but I, I have actually like a question and, and two small comments. Uh, the, the question is, uh, how do you see actually, because you know, the, the, there was a question whether transnational does go beyond uh, uh, the mere academic discourse. And uh, I wanted to ask everyone about their assessment because I, I, I would have contrary assessment than uh, than, than Raoul, because the, the only problem is that it goes maybe slower than the, nine, the, the scholars in the 90s have imagined. Uh, but for example, in the literature, uh, also in activist organizations, there is a lot what is transnational now. And I'm saying it as a person coming from activist organization. Uh, and one of them was in Moscow. Uh, and finally, uh, when you were saying that imperial history is a kind of might be interpreted as an imperial centrist project. Like new imperial history in Moscow, it's not really a thing. New imperial history, it's a Kazani project. Uh, the scholars didn't really reach Moscow. I mean, one of them reached Moscow. Uh, by now, is of course, gone. Uh, the two others didn't even reach Moscow. They, I think both in Chicago. Uh, 
And uh, when we were talking about minorities and post-colonial, that was kind of a trigger word at higher school of economics, so the, the most liberal university. Uh, so there, it's, it's a very, very political project which was clearly anti, uh, you know, anti the propaganda project. Uh, I wouldn't say that police was coming, but I, not really sure that they came to several of the events which we did. But it was certainly, you know, it, it's not it's not part of this positive image of the empire of post empire. There is there is kind of this variety of uh, uh, of, of minorities which are there. I think minorities, it's you know, international minorities, should be uh, invisible. So so this is why I wouldn't really agree with the, uh, with with seeing new imperial history as, as part of the continuation of an imperial history. Yeah, and the second thing is when we were telling that there are no transnational book projects, the textbook projects, there are two, French, German, and Polish German. And, yeah, and that to, to confirm your uh, skepticism toward it, the, the Polish German, the second volume, or the first volume, like the last volume of the project. Product is, I think you, you can trace it for like rough, roughly 100 years old. Uh, so it's, it's a long project to, to, to write something like this. Uh, the project was uh, finished, but it was not accepted by the government, which uh, kind of, uh, of course, said that it doesn't represent enough of the Polish uh, uh, Polish position in the like German uh, German propaganda inside. Uh, but in any case, it I mean it is there, and it might be that it will uh, be used in, in textbooks. Uh, I mean in teaching, uh, really. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Well, I just have a footnote, uh, again, just to defend a little bit new imperial history. Uh, I think it's um, really a misinterpretation to think about the management of diversity as a concept, as something which celebrates diversity or celebrates empire for diversity. It, it, it is very clear that we use this term from Cooper and Burbank as, as a tool of rule, right? Through diversity. So it's not something Anyway, you know what I mean. Thank you. Yes. Jasper? Yeah, if, I can, if I can answer that quickly, Jan, yeah, the activism, I think, was there before academia was. So ac activism is transnational, was transnational, I think, before the transnational term, turn in, in history began. So I, I, I wouldn't say it's not present outside academia, in terms of anywhere in civil society. My point was in any kind of study of history that's pre-university, you don't find this. And again, I'm, I don't want to be too categorical. You're absolutely right about the transnational textbooks. Um, I know a few other examples, one that's actually Balkan based, and it's meant to give a history of the Balkans that would be non-conflictual and reconciling, um, including you know, textbook writers from all the Balkan member states, are they going to be mainstream in national systems of education? And here, yeah, like you said, the textbook exists, the Polish government refused it. The same thing will probably happen to other transnational textbooks, unless it's a state-driven initiative like the French-German one. If these come from civil society or from individual historians, my feeling is that the states will not accept them. Also, I don't think they will forever be excluded. I was just thinking that curricula will stay national. Uh, they might give more space to transnational or European histories, but these would still, however, be framed in the framework of a curriculum that's first and foremost national. Um, that's what I was trying to say, not that European history is not taught or <laughs> global history is not taught. It is, and I think it will increase. New Imperial History, it was, you know, ab absolutely about diversity and absolutely, you know, the, the, the New Imperial History does not make empire look overwhelmingly positive. Think of the reaction of, of to the article of that guy who said, you know, <laughs> colonialism has it, had its perks. So I'm not, I'm not accusing New Imperial Historians of saying this. I am saying that on a, on a very subtle level, this might have been used and, and again it's it's not my argument necessarily because i'm not a russianist but someone from ukraine found that this could be read as part of russia's soft power um 
it, it could be read as, as something that made us a year ago i was in one of the best conferences i've ever been to in indiana and the big question was how could we miss this that being the invasion of Ukraine. We're all East Europeanists here. There were, there were more than a hundred of us in the room. And the guy organizing the conference opened with saying, how did we all miss this? Why is, I mean, talking to even Ukrainian friends the night before the invasion, they were saying, it's not gonna happen. Um, my, I was trying to raise a question as to how did we miss this? Could new imperial history be part of the, the of the reason i'm not saying it is i'm saying what if it is um it, and sure <laughs> maybe to mention another transnational project, which I, I wanted to mention because I should have mentioned it, uh, it's, it uh, uh, which is not a high school, it's, it's a high education uh, textbook, uh, which was uh, done for bachelor students. And it was a great uh, European enterprise to do it. It was seven or eight universities involved with the coordination of Utrecht. And we, we try to organize the chapters, not among national lines, but uh, among different problems, such as state building, nation building, uh, 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 social movements, uh, uh, knowledge transfer, whatever. So uh, it, it was, a, as it was a large co cooperation, it, it had its difficulties, but, but I think that the, the, the outcome uh, was uh, was was quite quite good example of uh, telling uh, European history in a transnational way without dividing it into nations or without uh, dividing it into West and and East. Okay, that's sorry. just to add one very brief comment that I think we shouldn't forget that at most universities there is still the. German history course, the Dutch history course, even the departments are organized in such a way. So these fossilized structures might not be ready to actually accept this kind of innovation. Kabur? Well, it's a... First, it's a kind of comment of just joining this discussion and not just new imperial history, but also, Raul, you are, you put yourself in this very uncomfortable shoes of quoting others and then being taken for account for what they are saying. So it's a, I would say it's a typical mistake of some big beginners, but <laughs> so, uh, so it's also uh, something about, uh, what you said about the impossibility of translating, uh, at least for Martin van Ginderachter, translating national indifference into a Western concept. And without really knowing what he meant with it, I can imagine that one of the reasons is that uh, national indifference in this case is very much uh, associated with some kind of interethnic context where this kind of interet the national is actually uh, somehow uh, encountering otherness in an ethnic sense. And less about uh, what could be actually interesting also from uh, in your project as well, is the different imaginations of the nation from within the nation. That's also creates situations that can be read as indifferent. Like it's a very typical complaint of uh, Hungarians coming from Romania to Hungary that they are considered to be Romanians. Even though you hear it, I mean, every week that we have suffering Hungary, even today, we have suffering Hungarians who deserve to have their autonomy, who don't have ne the necessary uh, minority rights where they are living. And they, they just cross the border and they are suddenly <laughs> treated indifferently. So people are not complying with normative aspects of the nation and this is indifference but it's i understand sort of understand why it is hard to sell in a western context because you should go further up 
on the ladder of abstraction to a certain extent. It's very easy to understand why it is indifferent uh, not to take seriously these inter-ethnic uh, differences in an Eastern European context. So this is, and the question to uh, Imre, because you seem to have the, uh, so you worked on, on this uh, new uh, huge book on European history. Uh, and this, I think it goes to, to something that was mentioned or tackled by several uh, uh, presentations, but probably came to the fore most forcefully in Raoul's, the different semantics. And the, so not just the different state of, uh, of that national historiography that you evidently should have based your synth synthesis, but also the different semantics. How you handle this situation that the, 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 these topics are actually researched unevenly, and even if they are somehow at the same level in terms of the research devoted, you still probably have a very different story, even if the words are the same <laughs> that are there. So, maybe I think uh, maybe. Um, I think we are history education or uh, university education in history should be uh, uh, investing more efforts is in nationalism theories. Uh, I mean, there's a whole school. Uh, there, are, there are many schools yeah, uh, uh, outside historiography, uh, in sociology, in political science, anthropology, and so on, providing us with wonderful results from around the globe. Uh, uh, and most often showing that this uh, concept of national mobilization is a very fragile sto story. Yeah? Uh, it always has to be somehow reified and it's, it's not working. <laughs> From time to time it works. Yeah? Um, and I think um, uh, when we talk about post something or trans something, I think we should go more into the details of what are findings in nationalism theory and how we can apply it when we deal with societies in the past. I think this is an avenue to go which pays off. But if you look into the curricula of the history teaching universities, it's hardly done. It's, it's mainly something, a hobby of some uh, people who are paid in a research project or because they are in a reading group. But mainly, um, if it would have been taught on a, on a, on a better basis uh, throughout the education, I think we, we would be more relaxed with this, I don't know, hubris of the nation that is somehow coming and we are afraid and, and scary about it. Uh, uh, I think that, um, that this is a, just a comment to, to all of this skepticism and so on. I wanted to do something positive. There is a, there's not just black, there could be also agency to us. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll start from, from, from the last one, as, as usually, the, the easier way to, to go about it. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, teaching of, of nationalism, of theories of nationalism is missing and would put nationalism in perspective um, and all that. But I think one of the premises that Peter was mentioning in the introduction is history as a discipline in the modern period appeared in conjunction with nation building projects. And it was fundamentally national history meant to instill national identity to populations. That's when it became popular. So it became teaching, so especially when it comes to teaching, it's a, it's a, it's an uphill struggle to displace it from this position because it's, <laughs> I don't know how to, how to put it. So it doesn't sound too psychoanalytic, but I think it's, 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 it's embedded in the system. The notion of, of the national framing is, is kind of embedded in the system and not easily displaceable by us pointing out at its limits, pointing out at its academic failures and so on. And, and I, 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 I agree with, with what you were saying. This would help put things in perspective. I don't see nationalism as the boogeyman. Um, and that was not my point to point at nationalism as the, as the boogeyman. I do think there's more to it than the nation. Uh, maybe because for me the nation was kind of irrelevant, um, always, but maybe for other for other reasons. Um, 
the, I think, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm skipping to this to, to I'm, I'm connecting this to the Gabor's question regarding the different imaginations of the nation. I think a big word missing there is the state. Um, and when I was dealing with national indifference, if you're talking pre-World War One Romania, many of these inter-ethnic, intermarriage, amphibianism that Zara and Jatsan Son write about, they don't exist in Romania. Romania is ethnically homogenous prior to World War One. 92% in the 1899 census declared themselves Romanian. And why? And, and they are nationally indifferent. They're so nationally indifferent. So why are they nationally indifferent if they're ethnically homogenous? So it's not about ethnic homogeneity. And therefore, with this colleague I'm working with, Andrei Sorescu, we, we, we are tending to call the state indifference. They don't care about the state. Uh, the state is trying to get there to mobilize them. They're trying to, it's trying to nationalize them. What they don't care about is not the Romanian nation as a construct. I mean, they don't speak any other language. They don't have any other uh, belongings. But, but what they don't care about is being citizens of a state. Now, the state could have been an empire, just happened to be a national state at the time, but they didn't care about it. So it might have to do with this as well. Um, again, a lot to be said when it comes to theories of nationalism. Banal, why is banal nationalism popular when, when talking about Western Europe and national indifference when we talk about Eastern Europe? Um, they're slightly different, you know, variants on a theme, but they're still very popular. The, and, sorry, sorry, the most important book on national indifference is Eugene Weber's Presence in the Frenchman, which is uh, on, 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 on France in the 19th century. This telling the same story. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, is it an exception, though? To some extent, yes. I mean, I've, that is, for me, one of the classic books of nationalism that hasn't been mentioned and so on. It hasn't been followed up, has it? And Eugen, Eugen Weber came from Romania, and he was of, of a Jewish background. Just saying, I mean, Eugen Weber had some interesting insights on both Romania and France. Um, but his background does matter. Anyway. To go to the Gabor's comment about quoting others, yeah, well, first of all, th those were the instructions to talk about what other scholars are doing who are at the cutting edge. And I think this is an interesting cutting edge. I quoted it. I don't say I'm standing 100% by it, but it does intrigue me enough to mention it. If it didn't, I wouldn't have brought it up. <laughs> That's my comment uh, on, on, on yeah, quoting others. Yes, uh, before replying to Gabor, I just want a small remark on national indifference in peasants into Frenchmen. I think that it, it is difference. National, there is a distinction which should be made. National indifference is, of course, a very ancient notion. Even 19th century nationalists used it, Czech nationalists used it, wrote it down that these people are nationally indifferent and what, what do we do? Uh, and uh, many so-called classical, more classical accounts of nationalism speak of indifference. I mean, Emil Niederhauser says at one point in one of his many books on Eastern European nationalism that uh, national activists who uh, created these cultural associations and went to the countryside had to fight an even more fierce enemy than the infamous former imperial censorship, and this enemy was indifference. So indifference is, is there in many accounts, but in these so-called uh, classical accounts, uh, it is put into a teleological framework. That is that indifference is backwardness. And as soon as modernity hits, like in presence into Frenchman, the Jules Ferry comes and takes away the kids and puts them into school where they learn what the French nation is. As soon as modernity hits, it disappears. And what uh, 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 the new researches have shown that it's not, uh, it's not going away with modernity forcefully. In Silesia, which was a very industrialized region with, uh, more importantly, maybe uh, very high literacy levels, uh, we can still show considerable uh, national indifference. So this was only a not so short comment. And uh, then uh, to uh, Gabor's question, well, thank you, yes, exactly. Uh, uh, you hit on the uh, you hit the nail on the head because this was extremely difficult, and some of the chapters became uneven because of this. It it uh, 
it could be seen when well it was up to the small teams how they divided the chapters and if they divided it into uh, uh, some sub chapters which was done by uh, and again we come back here by western european historian and uh, another chapters by a central european historian some uh, sometimes the perspective became a bit uneven and i have an anecdote about this which also relates to uh, national indifference in Western European countries because I collaborated in the chapter on uh, nation building, state and nation building in the 19th century. And I did introduce this concept of national indifference, but of course I could only, you know, relate to my research field, which was Central Europe. Uh, but the leader in our group, because every small group there was a some kind of leader, uh, he felt it to be uneven. So when I explained what national indifference was in Central Europe, he added the sentence that similar things can be shown in uh, Western Europe as well. And that was his solution, that, <laughs> that there was one, one sentence like this, and then the chapter became uh, round and beautiful. <laughs> Uh, I would like to uh, say thank you for the for the participants and uh, thanks a lot uh, for the audience and for the questions.